Hello and welcome to Indies News live from Islamabad. I'm Jawad Tehami and these are the headlines. Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi has stressed the need to resolve the conflicts in Afghanistan and Kashmir. In a panel discussion at the Antalya Diplomacy Forum, he said the Jammu and Kashmir dispute has made Sark practically dysfunctional. On the sidelines, Qureshi met with his Afghan counterpart Hanif Atmar and discussed the ongoing peace efforts in Afghanistan. He said that malicious propaganda based on allegations is a threat to the peace process. In Afghanistan, the Taliban have seized two districts in Jozjan and Faryab provinces as fighting rages amid withdrawal of foreign troops. 16 security personnel were reportedly killed and several others detained during the clashes. Earlier in a statement, the Afghan military claimed to have killed eight Taliban fighters in Jozjan. In Iran, hardliner Ibrahim Raisi has been elected the country's new president after securing nearly 62% of the votes. Raisi is Iran's top judge and is subject to U.S. sanctions. He will take office in early August. Brazil has logged nearly 2,500 deaths from COVID-19 and more than 98,000 infections overnight. Meanwhile, Palestine has cancelled the deal with Israel to provide 1 million COVID-19 jabs as the doses were about to expire. In Pakistan, 27 people lost their lives to the virus, while nearly 1,000 tested positive in the last 24 hours. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.84 million lives and infected nearly 178 million people so far. Those were the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi has stressed the need to dissolve the Afghanistan and Kashmir conflicts. He was participating in a panel discussion at the Antalya Diplomacy Forum. Qureshi said the Jammu and Kashmir dispute has made Sark practically dysfunctional. He added that the disputes are impediments to economic growth and stability in the region. The foreign minister also highlighted the challenges being faced by Asia in form of renewed arms race, poverty and climate change. On the sidelines, Qureshi met with his Afghan counterpart Hanif Atmar and discussed the ongoing peace efforts in Afghanistan. He said that malicious propaganda based on allegations is a threat to the peace process. He also called on Iran's foreign minister, Jawad Zarif, to discuss bilateral relations. Qureshi also held meetings with the foreign ministers of Malaysia and Kuwait. In Afghanistan, the Taliban have seized two districts in Jozjan and Faryab provinces as fighting rages amid the withdrawal of the foreign troops. 16 security personnel were reportedly killed and several others detained during the clashes. Over 30 districts have fallen to the group since May. Earlier in a statement, the Afghan military claimed to have killed eight Taliban fighters in Jozjan. Violence in Afghanistan has significantly risen as uncertainty deepens over the future of the war-torn country. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan says it will not allow the U.S. to use its military bases for future operations in Afghanistan. He made these remarks during an interview with HBO. The host asked Khan if he will allow the CIA to conduct cross-border counterterrorism missions once the U.S. withdraws from Afghanistan. The Prime Minister said, absolutely not. Khan's remarks come amid reports that U.S. spy agencies seek new proxies after the Afghan pullout. The U.S. warns Pakistan and other regional countries to cooperate on future operations to keep a check on militancy. 
Pakistan has rejected India's misrepresentation of the International Court of Justice's verdict in the case of Indian spy Kulbushan Jadav. A raw serving terrorist commander is facing death penalty over charges of espionage and terrorism in Pakistan. He confessed to his crimes in 2017. In a statement, the Foreign Office said Islamabad chose to provide him the right of review by the country's superior courts. It said the ICJ judgment also requires India to arrange a lawyer for Jadav, but it is deliberately confusing the issue. The Foreign Office said New Delhi's refusal to avail the legal remedies revealed their nefarious designs. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi is expected to hold an all-party conference on Kashmir on the 24th of June. This will be the first such political engagement since New Delhi stripped the region of its autonomous status in August 2019. The Indian media quoted officials from the Prime Minister's office as saying local parties have agreed informally to participate in the meeting. They said the government is keen to restart the democratic process in the region. They also said... There has been an effort to speak to public representatives and have them participate in the process. In Iran, hardliner Ibrahim Raisi has been elected the country's new president after securing nearly 62% of the votes. Raisi is Iran's top judge and is subject to U.S. sanctions. He will take office in early August. World leaders, including President Vladimir Putin, Rajab Tayyip Erdogan and Prime Minister Imran Khan have congratulated Raisi on his win. Meanwhile, Amnesty International said Raisi should be investigated for alleged crimes against humanity. Raisi has been Iran's judiciary chief since 2019 and has held several other posts in the country's judicial branch since the 1979 revolution. The Arab coalition in Yemen says it has destroyed seven explosive-laden drones launched by the Houthis towards southern Saudi Arabia. In a statement, the coalition said Houthis attempted to target Hamas Mushaid city in the latest strike. However, Houthis claim that they have successfully targeted King Khalid Air Base in Hamas Mushaid. Earlier, U.S. envoy for Yemen, Tim Lenderking, noted the need for the Yemeni government to return to the city of Aden as soon as possible. Lander King recently returned from Saudi Arabia where he held multiple meetings with all stakeholders. In a statement, the State Department said Lander King highlighted the importance of swift progress in the implementation of the Riyadh Agreement. The U.S. is pulling missile defense systems, military hardware and personnel from Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East. In a statement, Pentagon said some of these assets will be returned to the U.S. for much-needed maintenance. A Pentagon spokesperson says some of them will be redeployed to other regions. The spokesperson said Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin instructed the commander of the U.S. Central Command to remove the forces this summer. The U.S. bolstered military footprint in Riyadh after an attack in 2019 on Aramco facilities that disrupted the global oil supply. Meanwhile, it sent Patriot missile batteries into Iraq to defend U.S. forces following the killing of Iran's General Qasem Soleimani. The U.S. has warned that the wildfire of terrorism is sweeping across a band of Africa and needs the world's attention. U.S. General Stephen J. Townsend made the remarks at the end of a military drill with American, African and European troops. Townsend said he's concerned about the security situation across a band from the Sahel region in the west to the Horn of Africa. He noted deadly attacks by Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab and said all of them are on the march. The African Lion War Games, which lasted nearly two weeks, stretched across Morocco with smaller parts held in Tunisia and Senegal. It saw more than 7,000 troops from seven countries and NATO carry out air, land and sea exercises together. The United States has prepared contingency funds to help Ukraine in case of a possible escalation on its border with Russia. In a statement, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the idea to hold back security assistance to Ukraine is nonsense. Saki said the U.S. provided a $150 million package of security assistance to Ukraine before Biden-Putin summit. 
She noted the U.S. has provided the entire amount appropriated by the Congress through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. Saki said the U.S. president reconfirmed su support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity to Russian president. The summit between Russia's presidents, Vladimir Putin, and his U.S. counterpart, Joe Biden, took place in Geneva last week. Germany says the EU should maintain dialogue with Russia despite major differences on issues. Chancellor Angela Merkel made these remarks in a press conference with French President Emmanuel Macron in Berlin. She said Russia is a big challenge for the bloc, but it is also a continental neighbor of the European Union. She noted if Brussels wants security and stability, it must maintain dialogue with Russia. Merkel also welcomed the U.S. spirit of cooperation, saying President Joe Biden brought it back to international relations. I believe when U.S. President Joe Biden meets Russian President Vladimir Putin and holds an open dialogue, it is also important that we on the European side do the same. Only discussions allow for an insight into the other side's position and especially in regards to Ukraine. We know that only talks in the Minsk format have any kind of chance to maybe progress in tiny steps, even though that's very difficult. In his address, Macron said EU member states need to coordinate their COVID-19 border reopening policies. And now moving on, Brazil has logged nearly 2,500 deaths from COVID-19 and more than 98,000 infections overnight. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.84 million lives and infected nearly 178 million people so far. More in this report. As Brazil's official death toll approaches 500,000, the Senate is probing whether President Jair Bolsonaro deliberately delayed securing timely supplies of vaccines. While some epidemiologists say Brazil's real figure is significantly higher. Bolsonaro argues official death toll from his own health ministry is greatly exaggerated. Over in the north, Canada has extended border restrictions on non-essential travel with U.S. until July 21st. In the U.S., President Joe Biden took a cautious victory lap as he announced that 300 million vaccine shots have been administered in the 150 days since he took office. And the truth is that deaths and hospitalizations are drastically down in places where people are getting vaccinated. But unfortunately, cases and hospitalizations are not going down in many places in the lower vaccination rate states. They're actually going up in some places. Italy has introduced mandatory five-day quarantine for visitors from Britain as concerns grow over a highly contagious Delta variant that is spreading there. In the Netherlands, face masks will mostly no longer be required and other restrictions will ease from next week after a drop in cases. Meanwhile, AstraZeneca said the European Union lost a legal case over the vaccine supply as the court rejected Bloch's request for more deliveries by the June end. Over in Palestine, health authorities cancelled a deal with Israel to provide 1 million COVID-19 jabs as the doses were about to expire. After an examination by the health ministry staff of the first Pfizer vaccine shipment that was received today from Israel and that made up around 90,000 doses, it was found that they did not meet specifications in the agreement. Prime Minister Mohammad Shatayeh instructed the health minister to cancel the vaccine exchange agreement with Israel and to return today's shipment to Israel. In India, more than 1,600 people lost lives and over 60,000 tested positive in the last 24 hours. Meanwhile, World Health Organization voiced alarm over surging cases across Africa as more contagious variants spread amid dangerously low vaccination rates. Pakistan says the country is set to receive fresh supplies of COVID-19 vaccines from tomorrow. A top health official said the government has placed emergency orders for fresh supplies to overcome a countrywide jabs shortage. In an interview, Faisal Sultan added that the country is slated to receive around 7 million doses by the end of June, mainly from China. He noted that the situation will be normalized from Monday after the arrival of fresh supplies. The country has reported 27 deaths from coronavirus in the last 24 hours, the lowest since March 21. 
Overall, Pakistan has recorded almost 22,000 deaths and more than 947,000 cases since the pandemic began. More stories to follow were right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Pakistan joins the international community in commemorating the day for the elimination of sexual violence in conflict. This International Day reaffirms the principle of the universality of all human rights which apply in conflict areas and occupied territories. In a statement, Pakistan's foreign office said the Kashmiri women face sexual violence at the hands of Indian forces. It said sexual violence even against children in occupied Kashmir has drastically increased since the 5th of August 2019. The office called on the international community to take note of the crimes against Kashmiris and urged India to respect United Nations resolutions. Meanwhile, the United Nations said sexual violence in conflict is an abhorrent crime that is often underreported and must end. United Nations Special Representative Pramila Payton said sexual violence has been used as a tactic of war throughout history. The UN held a virtual event in line with the 2015 resolution to express solidarity with the survivors of sexual violence. As multiple crises shift the ground beneath us, we must seize this opportunity to build back better by tackling the root causes of sexual violence in conflict. In this transformative moment, we must aim high. Survivors must be heard and heeded by national authorities and policymakers as part of an intersectional, gender-responsive pandemic recovery. According to the United Nations, the coronavirus pandemic has further compounded the inequalities this year. The United Nations has called for all member states to prevent the flow of arms into Myanmar. This is part of the UN General Assembly's non-binding resolution to condemn the military coup. The UN also urged the military to respect the November election results and release all political detainees. UN Special Envoy on Myanmar, Christine Shreina Bergena, warned of a possible large-scale civil war. Meanwhile, Myanmar's envoy, Kya Moten, regretted that the body was not more explicit about an arms embargo. The bill was supported by 119 countries, while Belarus opposed and other 36 abstained, including Russia and China. According to an advocacy group, the military has killed at least 870 civilians since it seized power on February 1st. North Korea's Kim Jong-un has promised to navigate his country out of economic crisis. Kim made these remarks at his party's Central Committee meeting in Pyongyang. State media says Kim has appointed new members of the powerful Politburo of the ruling Workers' Party. During earlier sessions, he acknowledged food shortages and urged officials to prepare for both dialogue and confrontation with the U.S. Kim's remarks came as U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Sung Kim, arrived in South Korea. During his five-day stay, he will hold talks with the Japanese and South Korean counterparts over stalled nuclear diplomacy. Nigeria's army says a student from a group of dozens abducted from a school this week has been found dead. In a statement, an army spokesperson said troops found female students' body in the forest. He said the army has also rescued five students and two teachers after an exchange of fire with the kidnappers. The spokesperson added the troops have also recovered 800 stolen cattle. Gunmen raided the school in Kebi State on 17th of June in the latest case of mass abductions in the region. A teacher said gunmen kidnapped more than 80 students for ransom. However, the police did not disclose the number of missing students but said five teachers were abducted. In Armenia, supporters of opposition candidate uh, Robert Kocharyan rallied ahead of snap parliamentary elections this weekend. Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan had called the early polls to end a political crisis after last year's war with Azerbaijan. Some 20,000 gathered at a central square in the capital Yerevan to protest against the government. A survey indicates that 28.7% of voters favor Kocharyan's Armenia alliance and 25.2% Pashinyan's civil contract party. 
whoever forms a majority in the parliament can elect the prime minister. Kochiryan has promised that he will start negotiations on Nagorno-Karabakh's borders if he comes to power. The EU's foreign policy chief has warned that Lebanese leaders may face sanctions unless they pull the country away from financial collapse. Speaking in Beirut after talks with Lebanese President Michel Aoun, Joseph Borrell said the crisis in Lebanon is a domestic one. Borrell delivered a message of firmness to all Lebanese political leaders on behalf of the EU. He cautioned that the country is standing on the edge of financial collapse and urged the politicians to form a new government. Lebanon is facing what the World Bank has described as one of the world's worst economic crises since the 1850s. A political crisis has left the country without a government since the previous one resigned after a massive blast killed dozens in Beirut last year. In Argentina, thousands of protesters hit the streets of the capital, Buenos Aires, demanding improved wages and financial relief. The protesters, comprising labor unions and activists, called for a strong welfare state. They spoke out against the country's international debt obligations. The ongoing coronavirus pandemic has made Argentina's already ailing economy worse. UN data shows the economy is expected to shrink around 12 percent this year, driving millions into poverty. Venezuela's opposition says it will seek support from the U.S. and the EU for a gradual lifting of sanctions. Opposition leader Juan Guaido said a committee of politicians will travel to Washington and Brussels to consult allies. Talking to reporters, Guaido said the delegation will be led by opposition negotiator Gerardo Blind. It is scheduled to visit Washington from the 21st to 25th of June. Guaido added the committee is the same group that met with officials in Norway in recent weeks. It is aiming to establish a dialogue with President Nicolas Maduro's government. Oslo previously mediated talks between Venezuela's government and the opposition in 2019. Australia is considering listing koalas on the country's east coast as endangered. International Union for the Conservation of Nature has already listed koalas as vulnerable. More in this report. Often called the koala bear, this tree-climbing mammal has a pouch for the development of offspring. But their numbers are under pressure from logging, urban encroachment and a pervasive infection. Bushfires across New South Wales and Queensland states in 2019 and 2020 are estimated to have killed as many as 30 percent of the population. Scientists and academics have warned that the iconic Australian mammals could become extinct by 2015 in New South Wales. Australia's Environment Minister Susan Lay says she has asked the country's Threatened Species Scientific Committee to consider koalas on its endangered species list. Koalas need a lot of space, about 100 trees per animal, a pressing problem as Australia's woodlands continue to shrink. In the United States, California's extreme drought has compelled farmers to employ different methods to water their crops. A farmer in California's Central Valley has now no option but to fellow 2,000 of his 6,000 acres and dig deep for water. This report has the details. Farmer Salvador Para recalled the good old years when the ranch grew every crop. But the drought has changed everything as there is only blistering heat and few crops left. The drought has changed our farm to what it used to be. You know, it used to be we could see tomatoes, uh, watermelons, cotton, different crops being grown out here. And as these droughts have come, especially this year, uh, there's not very much being grown out there just because there's no water. There's literally no water. Para says farmers have managed to get water from an 800 feet deep well and also set up a pipe system. However, this pipeline has cost him dearly since it transports water from four miles away. He lamented the fact that the cost of the drought will ultimately be borne by the consumer. We know we're not going to have any water this year. There's water that's available. It's called supplemental water, but it's very expensive. So expensive that we can't put it on our garlic or our onions. It's just, it's like $2,000 an acre foot, where the regular price 
is 200 to 250 dollars an acre foot so 10 times the cost we can't afford it agriculture is an important part of california's economy and the state is a top producer of vegetables the last major drought from 2012 to 2017 reduced irrigation supplies to farmers and stoked deadly wildfires it's time for a short break we'll be back with more stories stay tuned Welcome back. NASA has reported trouble with a telescope that has been peering into the universe for more than 30 years. In a statement, the U.S. space agency said the Hubble Space Telescope has been down for the past few days. The telescope halted operations on Sunday after an issue with the 1980s era computer's memory module. NASA said attempts to switch to a backup memory module and restart the telescope have failed. However, it insisted the telescope itself and scientific instruments that accompany it are in good health. A newer and more powerful one called the James Webb Space Telescope is scheduled to be deployed late this year. It is designed to peer deeper into the cosmos than ever before. In New Zealand, a person has been killed and two other injured after a tornado left a trail of damage across the city of Auckland. Debris had been scattered across the streets in southern Auckland. The tornado brought down trees, tore off roofs and smashed windows. Authorities have urged people to stay out of the affected areas. Another business updates, Boeing Corporation 73 MAX 10 has successfully landed at Renton Municipal Airport near Seattle after its maiden flight. The 230-seat aircraft is expected to enter service in 2023. The jet is the largest member of Boeing's best-selling single aisle aeroplane family. It is designed to close the gap between Boeing 7379 and Airbus's A321neo in terms of seats. But its market opportunity is constrained by a range of 3,300 nautical miles short of A321neo's 4,000. Boeing has to complete the plane safety certification under tougher restrictions after two fatal crashes of a smaller 737 MAX version. Another weather situation from around the globe. And that's all for now with the latest updates. You can follow us on social media at Indus Talk News.